These fish is what sustain our people for thousands and thousands of years. We're fish eaters, kuyui eaters, trout eaters, and that's who we are. I'm here to catch Lahontan cutthroat trout. Pyramid Lake has the, some of the best fishing in our nation and maybe around the world. So it is, uh, it's a destination fishery. Tens of thousands of fishermen come to Pyramid Lake each year to fish for Lahontan cutthroat trout. And for tens of thousands of years, the lake has been home to the Numu people of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. In the last 10 years since the lake started, kind of picking back up in the quality of the fish. Uh, you feel silly to pass up a, an opportunity to come fish for cuts that are bigger here than they are just about anywhere else in the world, you know, so um, right in your backyard. Uh, my name's uh, Brian Hoffman, B-R-Y-A-N-H-O-F-M-A-N-N, -N -N, reporter for KTVN Channel 2 News in Reno. I'm out here covering opening day and I've talked to some amazing fishermen with uh, some, some amazing tall tails, I, I'm sure. A uh, 50 pounder that slipped away, I, I'm not sure if that really existed, but these guys are all enthused, got a bunch of energy out here. Some of these guys have been waiting since 5 in the morning to get in the water and haven't quite hit it yet, but there's a lot of excitement out here for opening day. 30 miles north of Reno and the same size as Lake Tahoe, Pyramid Lake has always been a destination fishery. Celebrities like Clark Gable found themselves at the iconic fishing ranches back in the 1930s. Back then, the fish seemed to be getting bigger and bigger, leading to the record 42-pound, 39-inch trout caught by Johnny Skimmerhorn, a member of the Pyramid Lake Paiute tribe. But what the fishermen didn't know is that the trout were unable to spawn, and the reason why the fish seemed to be getting bigger and bigger was because there were fewer and fewer fish. Anytime we come out, you know, in our native ways and traditional ways, we always honor our world, our creation. Every time I do come out, I offer, make an offer of tobacco. And so I was making that offer to the lake, to the four directions, to my spiritual protectors, but also for our people. And, and praying for, especially for our youth and for our elders and our leadership, that they stay strong as well, too. So it's, not, it's acknowledging in our way what's really important to our world, the importance of water, the importance of air, and the future of our people. To me, that's the priority. My name is Norman Harry. I was raised here, um, a Pyramid Lake tribal member. My traditional name is Teatu Katuru, which means one who is sitting at the highest point. We're sitting here in probably the most sacred area within our tribal homelands, and that's here at the Pyramid. Um, Stone Mother's just off to the left here. It's just always so special to be able to come down here and, and remember our ancestors who walked here before us. Um, but it's also a reminder when you look at the lake level, how much has declined since the Reclamation Act. Congress passed the Reclamation Act in June of 1902. Under the act, the Newlands Project was one of the first projects authorized. The project, drafted by Senator Francis G. Newlands of Nevada to provide irrigation water for the Lahontan Valley towns of Fallon and Fernley, 
was to include a dam that would divert water from the Truckee River, which is Pyramid Lake's only source of water. Construction on Derby Dam began in 1903. The diversion dam was completed in 1905 and diverted half of the Truckee River water flows into the canal, carrying it 32 miles across the desert to the Lahontan Reservoir, which was supposed to irrigate over 300,000 acres. had a huge impact. You can take a look behind me and see the upper elevation pre-reclamation days. And so when the water level was at that height, um, we're talking an 80 feet drop. When the dam was constructed, there was little consideration of the people, the lake, and the fish downstream. Senator Newlands was even quoted as saying Pyramid Lake existed only to satisfy the thirsty sun and due to his project, lake levels dropped by 80 feet. Pyramid Sister Lake, Winnemucca Lake, a rich wetland environment and valued resource, completely dried up. The Newlands project was also a huge economic failure. Less than a third of the land that Newlands had promised was actually irrigated. And in 1941, because the fish could no longer spawn up the Truckee, trapped in the lake because of the falling water levels, the giant Pyramid Lake Lahat and Cutthroat Trout was declared extinct. While fishermen from all over the U.S. traveled to Pyramid Lake for the trout, they usually disdain Pyramid Lake's other unique fish, the Kiwi. The Kiwi is an ancient sucker fish species that has been around for over a million years. Pyramid Lake is the only place in the world where kiwi are found and give the tribe their native name. However, as a result of the Newlands Project, it was the first fish listed on the Endangered Species Act of 1966. Our endangered species, or our namesake, is the kiwi, as the non-natives would call it, but in our language, we're kiwi. Uh, we're kiwi takata, which means kiwi eaters. The advent of water being taken out of base that it created uh, a barrier, a sand barrier, and just made it very hard for the fish to actually spawn at the river. The falling water levels of the lake that exposed the Truckee River Delta and led to the extinction of the trout put the kiwi at risk. To ensure the kiwi did not share the same fate as the trout, the tribe initiated litigation against the state of Nevada and the Department of the Interior. During the Washoe Act and other federal acts, the tribe was able to secure funding for a hatchery. The challenge, of course, was trying to get a hold uh, on our water situation. In the 1970s, a Kiwi hatchery was established, but the tribe still needed more water. And in 1973, a district court ruled the government had to maintain the level of the lake and ordered the Department of the Interior to reduce Derby Dam's diversion. There was so much controversy uh, and dealing with water issues back then. Um, it was pretty much everybody was against the tribe. And I remember going down to the hearing room, which I'll never forget, as we pass, going to the gauntlet of uh, different attorneys and different entities that had been opposed to the tribe. I heard off to the side that someone met, stated that uh, there go those damn Indians. And I never forgot that. While the tribe was successfully getting their water back, nothing could bring the trout back from extinction. But it hadn't been forgotten about. And over 400 miles away from Pyramid Lake, something big was happening in a small stream. Uh, my name's Mary Peacock, and I'm an associate professor in the Department of Biology at the University of Nevada, Reno. Well, it was in the, in the late 70s, uh, a Forest Service biologist was they were doing inventories in the Bonneville range, Bonneville Cutthroat Trout Range. And they came across this stream, the small stream population that they hadn't surveyed before. And when they looked at the fish, it wasn't a Bonneville. So they thought, well, what is this thing? And they thought maybe it was a Lahontan, but they brought in Robert Benke, who's a uh, very famous fisheries biologist, and had him look at this fish. And based upon the physical characteristics, this could be the original Pyramid Lake strain that had, for most of us, had thought it had gone extinct in the 1940s. Don was the Forest Service employee that found this fish, but there was a uh, 
what are called dowdy pawns, a, a person named, and I don't know what his first name is. He had private property and they brought the fish onto his land and put them in these large ponds to raise them. But I'm not sure what the status of that facility is now. My name's Don Duff. When I was a biologist for the Bureau of Land Management in Utah, doing surveys out in the west desert of Utah, uh, I discovered the Lahontan cutthroat trout. Didn't know it at the time, but confirmation through Dr. Benke at Colorado State University confirmed that it was uh, Lahontan cutthroat, pure strain. Well, you couldn't ask for a better day. came in that old road over there, it comes across the hill, <clears throat> and that's as far as you could go. And I had to hike across the stream. Well, not hike. I had to get on my hands and knees and crawl. It was about like 10 feet this way, and then a little bit of water, and 10 feet the other way. And about halfway through on my knees, I was, heard a rattlesnake. And I came out of that bush like a shot out of a cannon and landed across the stream in the other brush. And I looked back and there was a rattlesnake. If I'd have gone another couple feet, I would have got it in the face. But this was impenetrable, you know, I had to hike across the creek and uh, crawl across. That's where I ran into the rattlesnake. But, uh, and then I just found some open places and I'd jigged my fishing pole down with a fly on it. I didn't have a fly rod because it, you couldn't <laughs> fly fish here. Just had it on a regular spin rod with a fly and you're jigging down in these pools and uh, I found a few fish which looked pretty good and I kept walking up the creek uh, on the side hill because you couldn't walk in the center. So I just walk up the side hill and uh, find an opening and jig some more. Steve Dowdy is a property owner near the Pilot Peak stream where Don found the fish. Don feels like Steve has never received credit for his hard work, which includes building the three ponds on his property. I'm glad you're here because it needs to be documented what we found and then what Steve's done to protect it, you yeah. know? Because he needs to take, he needs to give him credit for doing all this work. You know, the diversion up here, the pipeline going down into the ponds, the raising of the fish for uh, umpteen years, 20 something. 20 some years, and the eggs that the Fish and Wildlife Service took. Uh, and then, uh, you know, they closed it down. Well, we said, I'm not going to let it close down. We're going to keep going. Oh, so we're two characters, huh? Yeah. <laughs> oh. My name is Steve Dowdy. I'm a landowner here, a pilot. Um, how did I find myself here? Um, I was in construction. Uh, bought some property, found this property, bought it, and uh, built me a dream home, built me a ranch. Uh, in that time, I was, uh, became involved in this discovery, um, the Lahan Ketchup Trout Pilot Stream. It became apparent after a couple of years that this was going to be prolific and, and uh, um, Lahont National Fish Hatchery came on board and they were elated to have three ponds. We knew it was special from the day we discovered it and the, the day that Dr. Benke confirmed that, yeah, I think this is the real thing. Don's just got my back, you know, kind of a father figure to me. I was here when he started almost, and uh, I've seen his son grow up. I've known him a long time. He's a good friend and uh, just a good guy. Oh yeah, no Don quite well. Uh, he's always been an advocate for getting this fish into hatchery production and to furthering research to actually verify that it was the original uh, Pyramid Lake fish. So yeah, Don ha has played an incredibly important role in this whole story. There was a lot of interest in being able to get uh, DNA out of museum samples. 
uh, a common preservative back in the day was formaldehyde. It binds to the DNA and it makes it very hard to extract the DNA so you can actually use it. So the techniques improved where we could, we could actually do that. And there are lots of museums across the planet that have vast collections of organisms. And some of these organisms are extinct now or have been greatly reduced in their range, like Lahontans. So my lab, uh, with, in collaboration with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, with the Lahontan National Fish Hatchery Complex, uh, decided that we were going to give this, give this a go. While the genetics of Don and Steve's Pilot Peak fish were being tested, the tribe's fight for water was not over. Without enough water in the lake, the rediscovered fish would have no chance of survival. Well, lo and behold, by 1990, 1990, 91, um, the Truckee River Settlement Act was approved by Congress. The settlement required the tribe to be consulted in all decisions regarding the Truckee River water and mandated that the water and reservoirs be used to restore and maintain the lake. The water could be loaned to towns like Reno and Sparks, but only during times of drought, which came in the 1990s and led to more negotiations. The second round uh, of negotiations, which was actually the Truckee River Operating Agreement, it was looking at how can we manage, best manage the um, reservoirs, which some of them were in California. A federal court ruled Stampede Reservoir, constructed to provide the towns of Reno and Sparks with water, would be managed to ensure fresh water for fish in Pyramid instead. However, those towns were growing at a rate of over 33% per decade, and so negotiations lasted much longer than expected. The water was not to be used for development or growth, uh, and so Everyone thought, well, all the parties said it might take maybe five to seven years. I think it was almost 13 years. Um, I remember it was February 28, 2003, uh, about three days before I left office, we went ahead and um, signed off on the administrative review for TROA. And so that was huge. The tribe was succeeding in their fight, and maybe the trout could someday come back home. But was the fish discovered near Pilot Peak actually the same fish that went extinct in the 1940s? Nobody knows how the fish could have found itself in a tiny stream over 400 miles away from the water of Pyramid Lake. My theory is that by uh, 1864, they were, were taking several thousand pounds of fish out of Utah Lake, and not to mention the fishing in the surrounding streams. So the, the streams were getting fished out. So um, they decided to import eggs from other hatcheries, specifically the Shasta Hatchery in, in California, uh, which was on the Intercontinental Rail Line, which uh, had a water stop up at Lucin, just north of us here. There was trains coming across bringing fish into Utah, probably Lahontan cutthroat eggs or fish from Pyramid Lake. Uh, some sheep herders, ranchers, who were out here in the valley said, oh, we got some streams up here, don't have any fish, because uh, it's a real hostile environment up here, as you've seen, on the shores of the Great Salt Flats. Uh, so they probably got some fish and, and brought them out here. I don't know that I ever heard that one completely from Don, but the story I heard was that um, they needed fresh water to feed the steam engines. The railroad had come through Wendover, so my take is, or the take I've heard of was that Perhaps the people doing the railroad brought the fish out as fry, small fingerlings, and threw them in the creek. But I sure like Don's story. You know, unless these guys took a cab at the Utah, uh, the Nevada border, <laughs> there's no way that they couldn't have them, have themselves moved to, into that water. I. Uh, wrote to these museums and got samples that were, you know, verified Lahontans collected in 1911 to 1913. So our plan was, if we were successful in getting DNA out of these museum samples, that we were then going to compare them to populations across the range and to this Pilot Peak strain that was found in Utah. One of those other strains was the Summit Lake strain, which the tribe had used to restock the lake in the 80s. However, that strain never reached the sizes of the original fish. What they did is brought in different strains 
spawned them and to develop a Pyramid Lake strain. And I think the last five years was primarily Summer Lake. One of the fishery staff members and myself, we went to where the Pilot Peak fish were to look at them. Professor Peacock's lab found that those fish from Pilot Peak were the closest genetic match to the original, thought to be extinct strain of Pyramid Lake Lahat and Cutthroat Trout. It was a small stream out in the middle of Utah. Didn't capture all the genetic variation, but range-wide, they, they matched the closest. One thing that was really interesting about this fish historically is it grew to very large sizes. And it had, it persisted in Pyramid Lake, which is a remnant of that ancient Lake Lahontan, for greater than 50,000 years. And so the test, of course, was going to be did this fish that was in this little tiny stream for 50, 60 years, had it retained these important lake characteristics? So we, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service uh, and the tribe decided that we would run this trial. However, that didn't mean the tribe was ready to trust the geneticists and another government agency. Our fish were called um, mutts. That's when I objected because I didn't understand that. The tribe here was really proud of what they produce. I think if they would approach a tribe in a different way, instead of speaking bad about the fish that we had in the lake, they believed they were inferior in. They meet their management objectives for recovery of a species. But um, I think over time, just understanding the genetics, we finally came to the decision to actually put them into the lake and see how they respond. That was in 2006, and by 2010, 2011, people started catching these fish, and they were big. I've got the blues, I feel so lonely. I'd give the world if I could only make you I believe both species are good, you know, Pyramid Lake Strain and the Pilot Peak. When they spawn up the river, they probably spawn together, so they're going to survive together. The trout are back home, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Well, the fish are very important to the tribe um, and to the environment, just keeping it going. They. Uh, they need help spawning, so we're here to help them. They come here to spawn because most of them have been acclimated to the lake water um, in this location. So it's, it's sort of like a, a homing device. They come back to where they were raised. We also have some of their relatives up in pools up on the shoreline, and they get the scent of that coming down the water and also the food that we're feeding them. First thing in the morning, the fish are sorted into males and females. The ripe females go into one bin, the males into another. Right male? When right they're ready female. to drop their eggs, their bellies will be real soft, and if you exert just a little bit of pressure, the eggs will come out. If they don't, then we call them green, and we throw them back and wait for them to ripen up. <laughs> and after we're done sorting, we take the females in and strip the eggs into a stainless steel bowl. The females 
since they're full of eggs, their bellies seem to be fuller. They tend to be more silver. And then we bring a male and fertilize the eggs. <laughs> then the eggs are stirred and cleaned and put in a disinfectant and water hardened for about an hour before they're transported to the hatcheries. and they're grown up to four to six inches. They're brought over here to lake operations, acclimated to the lake water, and then released into the lake. My name is Denise Shaw. I work for Pyramid Lake Fisheries, and I am the production manager. We go ahead and raise a fish till they're about four to six inches, just so they're just a good size to handle. And what we do is bring the fish into the trailer, we put them in a solution to knock them out, and we cut off the fin. That's a, a way to show that the fish has a tag in it. After we clip them, we take them over to the machine and actually put them in the machine and tag it. A small micro tag goes into the nose of the fish, and if it's tagged, it goes out one pipe, and if it's not tagged, it'll shoot out the other way. And then we just go through and keep tagging all day long. All the water from the cities of Reno, Sparks, Washoe County, it goes to the sewage treatment plant in Reno. After that, the water goes into, right into the Trekkie River. Lahan Kato Trout, when they're in the river, we have water quality standards to protect them. This site right here is a, one of our uppermost stations. Basically, we're, we're getting uh, surface grab samples at each one of the stations. The trend that we're seeing is that the water quality is getting better and it's due to all the restoration efforts. There's already a victory under the belt and now we're finishing to make sure it's done all the way right. So many stories you hear where, yes, you try to save a species, but then you're busy fighting people coming in. And in this case, they found out how to do it, found the right way to do it, and did it. It sets the benchmark for how to do these things. This was a particularly wonderful story because we thought this guy was gone. The way things came together, uh, the timing with our ability to actually look at museum samples and verify genetically that this was the original fish, is a great scientific you know, achievement, but the fact that they're now back in the lake is just warms my heart. Fisheries is, is not important. Fish and wildlife are not important it seems these days, but as long as we're around, we're gonna make sure that fish are important. We had one of the strongest water teams in the country with our hydrologists and attorneys, and I just really feel blessed that somehow we ended up with the entire lake within our reservation boundaries. We have a lot to be proud of. This is part of who we are as a people for generations. It's not only important to our people, but it's important to all, all our people, people in the Truck River watershed too. We always protect it to the seventh generation, but that means to eternity. We want to protect what we have here for all our grandchildren and their children to enjoy forever. My name is Autumn Harry, and I come from the waters of Pyramid Lake. My ancestors fought hard to protect our resources. The water, plants and animals, fish, all provide life for my people. Without the resilience of Kuyuipa, the lake, I would not be alive today. And Kuyui Againo, the lake and its fish, will not survive without a new generation prepared to protect them. The heart of this new generation beats in unison with the Numu that came before us and is woven within the lands that surround us. I imagine how this land looked when my ancestors walked upon it. I imagine ancient watersheds flowing through here with unimaginable force, undammed and pure, carving a path for the next generation because water is what sustains us. Pa no okwe tu, pa anusapita. Water is everything. Love the water.